Hi peeps, my name is Jamie Drew and welcome to my YouTube channel. If you are interested in spooky stories or true crime tales, please hit the subscribe button and make sure you turn on that little bell so that you are notified whenever I post a video. This video is the first video in my hometown horror series. In this series, I will be focusing on some of my favorite stories that have taken place in my home state of South Carolina. Today's story specifically takes place in Charleston, South Carolina. I work a few days out of the week in Charleston and I live outside of Charleston and I'm really excited to share this story with you because it is one that I grew up hearing and I always found it very fascinating and I'm sure you will too. Today's case is a semi-solved true crime case based in Charleston, South Carolina. It focuses on Lavinia Fisher, who earned the title of the nation's first female serial killer. And so for those of you who have not heard about her, let's go ahead and get started. Lavinia Fisher was born in 1793, and that's really all we know about her. We don't know the day she was born. We don't know where she was born at. We don't even know her main name. All we know is that in her early 20s, she did marry a gentleman named John Fisher and that they resided in Charleston, South Carolina. They eventually did purchase an inn, which they named the Six Mile House. And the reason they named it the Six Mile House was because it was located just six miles out of Charleston, South Carolina. Lavinia and John were known to be a very, very charming couple. Lavinia was absolutely gorgeous. And that is one reason people believe that their business was just so successful is because you had these weary travelers. Most of them were men that were stopping at this inn and they were being greeted by her and she was just so beautiful and so charming. So of course they wanted to just strike up a conversation with her. And that is a big reason that the inn was so popular. Lavinia and her husband John were also very business savvy. So in addition to their in business, they also had a side hustle. So they actually were the head of a gang of highwaymen that would trap, rob, and murder innocent travelers. Lavinia and John were really, so they were the head of this group, but they really were the ones who were in charge of everything. All of these murders were taking place at their inn. All of the gang members also resided at this inn and Lavinia would really be the one to put these murders into motion. So according to legend, Lavinia would greet these weary travelers at the door. She would invite them in for dinner, which of course, most of them agreed to. I mean, they'd been walking all day, they were exhausted, and they had the opportunity to sit down with this beautiful woman and eat a home-cooked meal. So, I mean, who would turn that down, you know? And so they would sit with her while they were waiting for their room to be prepared, and Lavinia would just strike up casual conversation with them. But as the conversation went on, she started really digging into not more so their personal life, but what they did for a living, um, if they owned a business, how well that business were, was doing, what they were doing here in Charleston. Maybe she would ask them what type of luggage they brought with them. She was really trying to get a feel for, are you worth robbing or not? If Lavinia was satisfied with their answers and she did feel like they carried belongings on them that were worth robbing, then she would send them to a special room and she would also send them up to their room with a cup of hot tea. And now this tea was not just, you know, your regular English breakfast tea. This tea was made with oleander leaves and oleander leaves are very toxic, even consumed in small amounts. And the goal of this tea was to make the traveler very tired. That way they would immediately pass out as soon as their head hit the pillow. Once the traveler was snuggled up in bed and enough time passed, Lavinia and her husband would pull a secret lever and the bed would fall through the floor, dumping its occupant into a room with spikes underneath. And if those, if the fall and the poison or the spikes did not kill the individual, then John would come in with his ax and take care of the rest of it. It is said that the couple murdered over 100 men this way, stripping them of their belongings and then burying them behind the inn. 
And of course, when you have this many people missing, family and friends are, they're freaking out, they're panicking. And so family and friends of these individuals were reaching out to authorities and the authorities also were getting curious. They noticed a lot of the individuals that were checking into the inn were not checking out. And so they did their best to look into it, but they didn't find any evidence. So there was really not much of anything that they could do. The Charleston locals felt that the authorities really were not doing their job and so they decided to take matters into their own hands. So they formed a group of vigilantes who went to the Fishers in February of 1819 and decided to put a stop to the events that were occurring there. Once the group of vigilantes arrived, their main goal was just to really run off all the individuals on the property. And so that's what they did. They ran off the fishers, they ran off all the gang men. And once they were satisfied that they had run everyone off, they just decided to leave. However, they did leave one individual behind. His name was David Ross and they left him behind just to keep an eye over things to make sure that no one came back and to make sure if they did come back, it was just to grab their belongings, just to make sure that nobody else was getting murdered that was staying there. While there, David Ross was attacked by two men who kidnapped him and brought him before a group of these gang members. And of course, Lavinia and John were there, was their gang, of course. And David saw Lavinia and just assumed that, okay, there's this really nice, charming lady. She's going to help me. And instead of helping him, Lavinia walks up to him. She wraps her hands around his throat, strangles him, and smashes his head through a window. And somehow, David Ross remains conscious the whole time. He survives and he makes a run for it to go tell local authorities. And one thing to keep in mind is that this inn is located six miles out of Charleston. So it wasn't like he can just run to a payphone, pick up the phone. He had to go the full six miles to tell the authorities. And so a lot is able to happen while he's traveling to go tell the authorities. So while David Ross is running to tell the authorities, a gentleman by the name of John Peebles, I am going to call him Peebles just so we do not him get him confused with John Fisher, stumbles upon the inn. And keep in mind, Lavinia and all the gang men are very on edge. They're waiting for the authorities to show up. So they don't want to take in any people to stay for the night. And Lavinia, she does answer the door and she tells people we don't have any vacancies and he's really exhausted. He's like, can't at least come in and sit down? And she's like, of course, you can just come in and sit down. We'll give you a meal and send you on your way. During this time, Lavinia, you know, does her thing where she sits down with him, just kind of talking to him and she starts doing her questioning. Why are you here? What are you doing? What business do you own? Just trying to find out if he's wealthy or not. I guess it's sort of her habit, you know, because she's done this with hundreds of other men. So I guess she just couldn't stop. And Peoples is just really, he's getting weirded out. Like, okay, this woman's just getting a little too invasive. And around this time, Lavinia decides, okay, we'll get one less rob in. I'm gonna go after this guy. So she goes to get her cup of hot tea and she brings it back to Peebles and tells him, I'm going to go check because we might have a room available for you. So when she leaves, Peebles, very fortunately, he doesn't like tea. He's not a fan of it. So he dumps it out just so he doesn't seem rude. You know, he's very fortunate that there may or may not be, a, or that there may be a room available for him. So Lavinia comes back and what do you know? She's got a room available and not just any room, it is her special room. So Peebles heads up to his room and he's just really freaked out. He wasn't a fan of the questioning. He felt like her husband John was just looking at him funny. And on top of that, she did tell him that nobody was staying at the inn that night, that 
it was closed off and he was hearing noises which what he was hearing was the gang members and so he was just freaked out so he gets to his room and he's really paranoid that he's going to get robbed and so instead of sleeping in the bed he decides he is going to sleep in an armchair by the door just so he can be alert and ready if anyone does decide to rob him and what do you know sometime during the night Lavinia or John must have pulled that secret lever and the bed falls through the floor. And this startles Peebles and he freaks out. And so he climbs through the window and he, just like David Ross, hauls tail six miles down the road to alert the Charleston authorities. Based off of these two accounts from both David Ross and John Peebles, authorities felt like they had enough evidence to pursue the Fishers. So they head to the Six Mile House and they immediately arrest the Fishers as well as a few other gang men who were there on the property. They also did a search and I found conflicting evidence as far as the amount of bodies. I found some accounts saying they found 100 bodies. I found accounts saying they found two bodies, but there were a few bodies that were found. The Fishers were tried separately from the rest of the gang members. During the initial indictment, they were actually charged with robbery and attempted murder of David Ross. However, this was eventually changed to highway robbery just because besides these two accounts, there really wasn't, the cops didn't find any evidence that linked them to these murders. And I know two of the bodies specifically, it was believed that maybe one of them had been a slave that was just buried in an unmarked grave or the other individual was someone who had just passed away by gunfire when the vigilante group came to run off the gang members from the Six Mile House. At their trial, the Fishers did plead not guilty. However, the jury was not convinced and they were found guilty of highway robbery, which at this time was a capital offense punishable by murder. However, the judge did grant them time to appeal and they were given a reprieve until January of the following year. The Fishers were housed at the Old City Jail in Charleston, South Carolina until their January court date. And because they were a married couple, they were kept together and they were actually kept in the debtor's quarters in the upper part of the jail, which was not as heavily guarded as the rest of the jail parts. So knowing that they were in a less heavily guarded area than other prisoners, they decided that they were going to escape. So in September of 1819, they put their escape plan in motion and in your cliche escape from jail way back you know in the old days they took all their linens and they tied them together to form a rope and they then threw this rope out of the window not really sure if they were bars or not they threw this rope out of the window and john climbed down he wanted to go first so john climbed down made it safely down however lavinia went to climb down and the rope broke so she's stuck in her cell and John is free. But John, being the husband goals that he is, he just could not leave his wife stranded in that cell. So he goes and prances back into jail and cops snatch him and they place Lavinia and John in a um, more highly secured cell block. So when they both were moved. I think they both realized that, okay, we can't escape and there's really nothing we can do. I mean, we're going to be put to death. And so John started, he started meeting with a gentleman named Reverend Furman, started praying. He wanted to get his life in order. Um, he wanted to go to heaven, of course, since he really couldn't escape death at this point. And Lavinia, she just was not having it. Um, she was reading law books. She was really trying to find a way that she could get out of this. And she did find a loophole that could save her life. And what was the solution, you might ask? Apparently, back in this time, you could not put a married woman to death. 
And so Lavinia goes and she meets with the judge and she tells him, I'm a married woman. I know my rights and you can't kill me, essentially. And the judge looks at her and he says, you don't think I've thought of that. We will put your husband to death first. The law says nothing about killing a widow. On the morning of February 18th, 1820, John and Lavinia Fisher were escorted from the Old City Jail in Charleston to the gallows right behind the building to be hanged for highway robbery. Over 2,000 people had crowded around the gallows and it is said that John and Lavinia both acted very differently that morning. John was all up under the minister. He was praying. He was just very quiet, whereas Lavinia just was very loud. She was yelling at people. Clearly, she was more frustrated than him um, and not as accepting to her fate. As we all know, from what we previously said, John was to be hanged first, and he wrote this letter that he gave to the minister that he wanted read out loud right before he was hung, and basically the letter, it proclaimed his innocence, and it asked for mercy upon those who had done him wrong in the judicial system. John then began to verbally plead his case, however, right before they pulled the lever for him to fall through. He started yelling out, asking for forgiveness for those he had done wrong to ultimately contradicting his letter. And once John was dead, it was now Lavinia's time to go. And Lavinia was wearing a white gown. Most people say it was a wedding dress. She did believe she was going to be pardoned up until her death. Um, she was also very young, she was only 27, and she was very beautiful. So she also thought that, okay, maybe I can convince someone to marry me right before I'm hung, that way they can't hang me. Or it, the dress was to represent her marriage to the devil that was about to happen. As Lavinia made her way up the platform, and when she got up there, and she was standing where she was supposed to stand, and they went to go put the cover over her head she yelled out if any of you have a message you would like to send to hell give it to me and i will carry it and before the executioner could even tighten the noose around her she decided to take her ending into her own hands and she jumped off the platform ultimately taking her own life both Lavinia and John were buried in potter's fields. These fields were used for people that were not claimed by family or friends or for indigenous people. And as of today, these fields were actually plowed over and a military school was built on top. And in today's world, the Medical University of South Carolina is actually buried over the potter's field that Lavinia and her husband, John Fisher, are actually buried in. Because this is such a horrible story for both the victims and the perpetrators, Lavinia is said to haunt the old city jail in Charleston, South Carolina. Many people have seen her floating in between bars. You can hear her yelling at individuals as they go by and she is the most popular ghost in the old city jail and so that is the story of lavinia and john fisher if i haven't said this i will say it now this story took place a very long time ago and there are different accounts as to what happened but like i said this is my favorite ghost story and I thought I would share it with you all. So if you liked it, please hit the like button. And if you didn't, I am so sorry. And I will be having different stories that will have actual facts that I will be sharing later on in the future. And leave comments, give me feedback. How can I do better? What are some stories that you all wanna hear? But thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you all back on my channel soon. Bye.